All right, I'm on. We are recording. I'm going to, we, we left off last time. Um, we're still talking about tissues. Just to bring you into context, the four main tissue types in the human body are epithelial, connective, muscular, and nervous. We've, we've finished epithelial tissues as well as some talk about cellular junctions. And we're moving on to connective tissues. This is the beast. This is the worst one, in my opinion, um, because it's the most abundant. It's the most varied tissue in the human body. So I'm going to plow through that. I'm going to try to hit as many details as possible, but don't uh, disregard the, the textbook, okay? So without further ado, let me in, admit somebody really quickly. Uh, I'm going to go to my first whiteboard and get started here. I'm just going to write connective tissues. And I'm going to abbreviate that CT. So every time from now on when I write a capital C, capital T, that'll just designate connective tissue. Um, like I just said, this is the most abundant somebody there. This is the most abundant tissue type in the human body. It's also the most varied. So there's a lot of variable different kinds of connective tissues, and we're going to hit on those. <clears throat> Some other um, general characteristics of this business. Your book classifies just connective tissues into four main groups or classes, however you want to put it. Um, different books do different things. Some of the language is the same. I'll try to stick with this particular publisher because I know that's what you have for a resource. And they do it like this. Connective tissue proper. <clears throat> cartilage. Bone. And fluid. I'm going to try to get through all of these today. Connective tissue proper has subgroups to it. And so I'm just going to write off of here, loose and dense. The classification of these tissues is the most challenging part of it. There's not, it's, this is not rocket physics. This is not anything that you can't understand. Quite frankly, it's just kind of an organizational challenge. <clears throat> so that's um, part of my job is to help you organ organize this and understand it. So without, before we go into these specific classes or groups of connective tissues, I'm just going to hit some general characteristics of all connective tissues. First, they all, they have a common origin. And what that means is embryonically, or embryologically, um, they all come from the same embryonic tissue. So they all come from a tissue called mesenchyme, and that's embryonic. When we are developing in utero, uh, different tissues come from different origins, and all connective tissues come from mesenchyme. Secondly, there's quite a varying degree of vascularity. Blood supply is what that means. So some connective tissues are highly vascular, rich blood supply, others are practically avascular. And finally, all, I'm gonna put a star next to this one, all connective tissues have something called a non-living matrix. And that's sort of what classifies connective tissues really as connective tissues. When I teach AMP2, um, the first unit in AMP2 is blood. And my first question to the class, because they were supposed to have taken AMP1, is what makes blood a connective tissue? And the, the answer I'm looking for when I ask that question is blood has a non-living matrix. <clears throat> so now I'm going to just 
do some structural elements. So I'm still under ger general characteristics. I'm gonna to go to a new whiteboard because I, I need more space. But let's talk about this non-living matrix. All connective tissues are made up of living cells and a non-living matrix. What does this mean? It's made up of the non-living matrix, something called ground substance. That's G-R-O-U-N-D. Ground substance and fibers. This is the non-living business. Fibers are pretty easy for most people to grasp. We know what a fiber is. It's a long stringy, in this case, proteinaceous, um, proteinaceous thing. So let's, I'm gonna talk about ground substance first. So ground substance is sort of the background material. It's the stuff that fills the spaces between the living cells and fibers. And it varies a, a whole lot. So your book calls it like an unstructured material that fills the spaces between the cells and the fibers. And it's made of fluids, a lot of water. So I'm gonna write fluids, water, polysaccharides, which you know are um, carbohydrates, long chains of sugars, and proteins. That's pretty much what makes this stuff up. It can vary from a very, a very fluid type of ground substance, AKA in blood and lymph fluid, or the ground substance can be extremely hard and brittle as in bone. So it varies a great deal. What this stuff does is it, it, it gives it structure that holds the cells and the fibers together in some sort of form. It also is functional. It helps nutrients and waste products diffuse through this material to and from the living cells. Fibers, <clears throat> I'm gonna just list the three main types of fibers that we find in connective tissue. And those are collagen fibers. Get their name because they are filled with the protein collagen, which is an extremely strong yet flexible material. So what, what most sources say is that the collagen fibers give the connective tissue, collagen in general, the collagen fibers particularly give connective tissue tensile strength, T-E-N, tensile strength. So there, it's flexible and yet it keeps things held together and from breaking. It resists tensile force. <clears throat> um, so these are the strongest of the three. Uh, to put that in the context, if you had a collagen fiber and it was the same size as a steel fiber, uh, coll collagen is actually stronger uh, in tensile strength than, than the material steel. Second type of fiber, I'm gonna go in the order of your book. It says elastic fibers. We all pretty much know what the word elastic means. These fibers get their name because they contain the protein elastin. So these contain the protein collagen, these contain the protein elastin. And it's not that these aren't strong, but they're thinner. They're not nearly as strong as collagen fibers. They're thinner but they're more flexible and their claim to fame really what they do structurally is they can stretch up to about 150% of their original relaxed shape without breaking and, and this is a big and so I'm going to underline so they can stretch and recoil, snap back into position. We all pretty much know what elastic means. I'm just ex explaining that in a little bit of scientific terms. And finally, the third type of fiber we find in connective tissues are called reticular fibers. I always picture these reticular fibers as sort of a cross between one and numbers one and number two. 
So they, they do contain collagen, not, not as much as number one. So they contain the strong protein collagen, but they're more flexible than number one. Okay. And they're, they predominate a specific connective tissue called, guess what, reticular connective tissue. So, and we'll, I'll, I'll mention this when we go over that specific tissue that's named for these fibers. Um, they give, these things give internal structure to organs. So number one, for strength. Number two, for stretching and recoil. Number three, kind of a combination of the both, but they predominantly are found in soft organs that need some sort of internal framework or AKA internal skeleton. Now I'm just gonna briefly list the living cells that we find in connective tissue. And this is just a short laundry list. Um, it doesn't mean, I don't wanna give you the impression that all of these cells are found in all connective tissues. This is just a laundry list of varying cells found in different amounts in different types of connective tissue. Before we do that, um, there's some language. This term blast is usually a suffix, which means immature cell. And blast cells usually secrete fibers ground substance. So that's where that non-living stuff comes from. It comes actually from, usually from immature cells secreting them. The word site, C-Y-T-E, usually, literally it just means cell, but it's usually a mature cell. And typically we give this suffix to mature cells that are no longer secreting things like fibers and ground substance. So after they secrete fibers and ground substance, blast cells mature and typically become uh, site cells. Just now for some examples of this, a fibro, sorry, I meant to write fibroblast. A fibroblast would be an immature cell that secretes fibers. Um, chondroblast is an immature cartilage cell because chondro means cartilage. So this is an immature cartilage cell that would secrete ground substance, the majority of that sort of thick, firm, gelatinous ground substance that we find in cartilage. Osteoblast Osteo means bone, so this is an immature bone cell, that's its literal definition, that secretes that hard calcified matrix that makes bone really super hard. So that's just an osteocyte would be a mature bone cell, a chondrocyte would be a mature cartilage cell. So that gives you an idea of <clears throat> what this language is when we talk about it. So here's our laundry list of, of cells now. So. That was just an intro to the language. And I'll use this language on the quiz and you'll find it in your textbook as well. So let's just list some cell types. Um, lipid cells or fat cells, you can think of them as fat cells, are found in pretty large number in many connective tissues. I'm gonna go in the order of your book and explain what some of these cells are if you're not familiar with them. Uh, they list white blood cells. I'm gonna give you the scientific name, leukocytes. That just means white blood cells. We oftentimes find white blood cells of all varieties migrating in and out of connective tissue. And all white blood cells, by the way, have an immune function, they fight infection. Might not have heard of these before. Mast cells, 
Mast cells specifically secrete histamines. So I'm going to write that. You, you've probably heard histamines or antihistamines. Histamines are just chemicals. And histamines are chemicals that um, cause vasodilation, our vessels to dilate and get larger in diameter. That increases fluid flow and that mediates or enhances inflammation. So they're regulators of inflammation by releasing histamines. The reason you take antihistamines when you have a cold is to reduce that fluid in your head. It's just a symptom reliever. Um, get used to this cell name because it will be used all through AMP1 and AMP2 a lot. Macrophages. Macrophages technically, um, well, first of all, they're a nonspecific immune cell. Some of them are stellate macrophages that, that stay in place where they, where they live and fight infection there. Other macrophages are wandering and sort of wander all through the body and nonspecifically attack any foreign invaders into the human body. Macrophages are derived from, so they're nonspecific immune cells. I'm just gonna put from monocytes. That's a type of leukocyte or white blood cell. When a monocyte typically migrates out of the bloodstream into tissues, it is then designated uh, a macrophage. And it just fights infection. It goes after anything that, that is foreign to the human body. Um, let's just leave it at that. Uh, that's, a, that's a good enough list for now. Um, I'm going to go on to the specific types of connective tissues and how we're going to how we're going to organize this and how I'd like you to focus your studies on individual connective tissues is I'm going to list connective tissues in the order of your book and give you maybe some general quick characteristics of that tissue, but mostly I'm going to list that tissue's location and function in the human body. So we're going to start with the first big category in connective tissues called loose connective tissue. <clears throat> Actually, uh, the big category is connective tissue proper. I don't use that term very often, and many sources don't use this. This includes loose and dense. I typically teach my students just the subcategories loose and dense, but your book uses connective tissue proper a couple times, so I thought I'd put it in context. So the loose connective tissues are as follows. There's three in this category. First is areolar connective tissue. This stuff really quickly um, has a, a viscous fluid type of ground substance. It has lots of fibers in it loosely arranged, sort of haphazardly arranged, and then living cells interspersed. So it kind of looks like a bird's nest with little cells living in it under a microscope. We find that, first of all, it's, it's, I think it's the most abundant connective tissue in the human body. It's, it's, it's almost everywhere, but specifically we find this in the dermis, the dermal layers of the skin, predominantly in a specific dermal layer that I'll talk about next week. So we find this in the dermis of the skin, also around, sorry, this, is, this pen is plastic on glass, around vessels and organs. This is a very general type of connective tissue. Its main functions, there's, there's more than what I'm gonna list here. It helps bind. So it binds one thing to another thing. It helps bind one type of tissue to another. For example, it sits right under our epidermis in the skin and it helps bind those superficial layers of the epidermis to deeper layers of tissues. It also provides, it's, it's highly vascular. So it has a rich blood supply that provides nutrition to other types of tissues. Right, nutrients. It also has an immune function because it's pretty packed with those macrophages, those nonspecific immune cells, as well as a, another type of immune cell 
that I don't even think uh, chapter four lists called a dendritic cell, which is a different type of an, an immune cell. All right, so let's go on to number two. Adipose CT, adipose connective tissue, just think fat, F-A-T. These are mosquitocytes or fat cells with a lipid droplet pretty much taking up the entire cytoplasm. So when we look at these cells under a microscope, they're, they're sort of organized like this. And what looks like a big white space is actually a lipid droplet. So the whole cell is almost filled with lipid and the nucleus gets pushed off to the side. So do, so do the other organelles. So we see this sort of conglomerate. This is typical uh, adipose tissue. The locations um, of this are also, you know that we have fat cells almost everywhere. The biggest places would be under the skin. So it's not actually in the layer of the skin like this one up here. It's underneath the skin in the hypodermis. So I'm just gonna write under skin, it also is around almost all of our vital organs. If you were to dissect uh, any human, um, for example, a, a major organ like the heart or the kidneys, there's a fairly large amount of fat around those organs, even in the most fit person, um, because it provides a, cu a cushioning environment, among other things, for those vital organs. So functions, I'm gonna write, um, Cushions. <clears throat> Next, I'm writing insulates. Helps keep us warm. It's also a source of energy reserve. The list is longer than that, but that's, that's good for now on adipose tissue. At number three, I'll try to squeeze it in on this board, is reticular. CT, because there's only three in loose connective tissue. I'm gonna to try to squeeze them all on this board. That's R-E-T-I-C-U-L-A-R, -E just like the fibers. Reticular connective tissue gets its name because it's full of reticular fibers. There's no secret about that. Um, it kind of looks like we see living cells everywhere. They're small. When we look at it under a microscope, it looks like a bunch of grapes on stems typically, and those, those stems that we say are the reticular fibers. Locations would be soft organs. Soft organs like the spleen, lymph nodes, those are always used as examples because they're usually the slides that we have when we're doing in-person lab. And also soft organs like the liver. And because the function is provides, this stuff provides an internal framework. So I'll try to squeeze that in here. Gives it an internal skeleton so that these soft organs don't just fall apart. All right, that takes care of the first three <coughs> in loose. So the second subcategory, we finished this one, the second subcategory in connective tissue proper are dense connective tissues. I'll do those on the next board. This is not the most uh, interesting stuff. It's not that interesting to me either, by the way. And I lecture about it every semester, but I, I, it's important. I think it's important because you need this groundwork in order to study each organ and organ, organ system um, more in detail. If you have this foundation of, of tissues, it'll help. So the dense, there's also three examples in this category. And they get their name just because they're more densely structured. The first one is called dense regular CT, connective tissue gets its name regular because the fibers, they're not all perfectly straight, but they're fairly densely packed and they all run in 
near perfect parallelism to each other like this when we look at it under a microscope. <clears throat> That's where it gets its name, dense and regular. The locations are pretty much tendons and ligaments. We're all familiar with those words. Um, the, the difference, if you're not completely straight on that, tendons attach muscle to bone. Ligaments attach bone to bone. So they're similar in structure and they're similar in function, quite frankly, but one of them is strictly a muscle to bone attachment and this one is strictly a bone to bone attachment. Functions are obviously connects, binds, and stabilizes. The stabilizing part comes in because we because we find a lot of these attachments near joints in the human body it helps stabilize those joints. <clears throat> All right, number two. Dense irregular CT gets its name because it's densely packed, but the fibers are not in a regular shape or fashion. Uh, it tends to look like this. It stains red under the microscope. It looks like this haphazard. Um, when we look at it for real in a real slide, I always tell students it reminds me of pieces of raw meat. That's sort of what it looks like, just kind of densely packed into an area. We find this stuff largely, it's also very abundant in the human body, but it's largely found in the deepest layers of the skin. So I'm gonna say found in the deep dermis. It makes up that the final thickest layer of the skin as a matter of fact. <clears throat> So its functions are that it helps anchor, it, bind, it also binds and connects. It's highly vascular. It can also cushion. It provides a lot of cushion for our skin, for our integument. <clears throat> and finally, number three, elastic connective tissue gets its name because you guessed it, it has a lot of elastic fibers in it, which contain the protein elastin. So its, it's functions are gonna um, reflect its structure. So I'm just gonna say full of elastin protein slash fibers. Typical locations that we find this are vessel walls. So our arteries and veins, in the walls of our arteries and veins, we find a lot of elastic connective tissue because it allows those structures to dilate and recoil and constrict. So the, uh, I'm gonna put comma, lung tissue. Likewise, our lungs expand and contract multiple times a minute for, for our entire lives. So we need a lot of elastic fibers in there as well. The function is pretty self-explanatory. I'm just gonna write allows for distension and recoil. Right, and we've made it through the dense connective tissues. So we are making good time, which is good. There's a lot to pack in today. So just to repeat where we are, what we've done, I'm just gonna try to go back to the previous board. Um, I'm gonna go all the way back to number one. We've done, we've done these. Connective tissue proper, three loose, three dense. Now we're gonna move on to cartilage, okay? So, if I, I'm just calling up a new whiteboard. <clears throat> 
and there's three types of cartilage in the human body. <clears throat> I'm going to talk just a minute about cartilage in general. It's tough, flexible, avascular, that means there's no blood supply, and also very little to no nerve tissue. I'm going to write nervous tissue. So it doesn't have a lot of vascularization, blood supply. In fact, it has close to nil. And nervous tissue as well. That's why, that's why people pierce uh, body parts that they pierce largely is because they don't feel the pain and it doesn't draw a lot of blood. You know, our earlobes, the tip of our nose, those are all cartilage areas that don't have much feeling or the, the, what you do feel when you do pierce those areas is usually nerve endings found in the more superficial layers of tissue like the skin. <clears throat> the matrix of cartilage contains some very specific ingredients. The first one is, I'm trying, let me move my iPad down so I can actually write chondroitin. It's C O, sorry, C H O N D R O I T I N, chondroitin sulfate. Chondro means cartilage, by the way. That'll help you remember where we find that stuff. <clears throat> Chondroitin sulfate, it also contains hyaluronic acid. Which is, it, that's usually secreted in a, a fluid form. That's uh, this sort of viscous fluid that, that um, increases flexibility as well as decreases friction. <clears throat> so it also contains fluid, I'm just going to write in parentheses, about 80% water. It's complicated, but some of these things, some of the things in the uh, matrix in the ground substance actually bind and attract water, which help, helps keep the cartilage kind of soft. The chondroblasts, just to use some of the new language that we learned at the beginning of this lecture, the chondroblasts secrete a new matrix. Okay. <clears throat> it's the most predominant cell type. Now let's go through the three types of cartilage. Well, first, That's hyaline, H-Y-A-L-I-N-E. Hyaline cartilage. This is the most abundant in the human body, so I'm just gonna write most common. And it's, it's tough to draw with just a pencil what it looks like, but it has kind of this glassy, very smooth background. I'll use blue, and I can't, I don't have time to readjust my pencil, but it's got this sort of light, smooth background. It's not this dark when we look at it under a microscope. And that background looks like it has these holes punched in it, like this. That's, it's very characteristic. And it has this light, smooth background that looks like somebody just poked holes in it, like this. The background that I'm drawing is the ground substance. Those holes are actually little cavities where the living cells live. We'll learn about the names of those cavities when we study the skeletal system and how those cells work and get nutrition. So that's what hyaline cartilage looks like. The locations would be things like the trachea. And those would be the hard rings in the trachea. So the trachea is just the airway, the tube, and it's a muscular, sort of a muscular tube with connective tissue. And then there's these cartilage rings embedded in that tissue that give this, that hold the trachea open 24 hours a day, so it gives it structure. We also find this hyaline cartilage at the end of the nose. We find it in what's called articular cartilage. <clears throat> 
which is the ends of bones, articular because we find it at joints where articulations are and it helps. If we, have, if we put a coating of hyaline cartilage on the ends of our bones where they articulate with each other, that's a smooth glassy surface that the bones have to rub against each other. It's not grinding bone on bone. So I'm just gonna write ends of bones. And finally, um, the connection of the ribs, which are bone, not cartilage, sorry, connection of the ribs to the sternum. And that's called actually costal cartilage, but it's made up of hyaline cartilage tissue. So that's where we find it. Its function is pretty basic. It, it provides support and connections, internal framework support, All right, let's do two and three on a new page. Remember, we're still talking about cartilage here. Second type, I'll, I think I'm going in the order of your book. It's called fibrocartilage. Doesn't matter if we go in perfect order, but I, I'll try to. Fibrocartilage, some books call fibrous cartilage, two words, doesn't matter, it's the same thing. And it's because the matrix has many more fibers in it than any other cartilage type well, certainly more than hyaline cartilage. So we see a lot more fibers. It's hard to draw, but there would be wispy fibers, visible fibers, as well as a background ground substance. And then we have those caves, those cavities where the living cells live, something like this. <clears throat> so those fibers give it strength. They are thick collagen fibers. Remember that's named for the protein collagen. <clears throat> but that's what gives fibrocartilage its name. It contains these thick collagen fibers and of course chondrocytes, which are cartilage cells. I'm just writing this out to get you used to the language. <clears throat> the locations that we find this are the discs between the vertebrae and they're called inter vertebral discs. We also find fibrocartilage in the, the meniscus of the knee. So I'm just going to write knee. That's just a pad of fibrocartilage that sits be between the distal end of the femur and the proximal end of the tibia, right in that knee joint. And its main function is shock absorption slash I'm gonna put slash cushion it's very effective so all of those discs between your vertebrae every time you that we take a step or particularly when we run or jump or walk on hard surfaces there's shock that goes all the way up through our body and these discs absorb that shock and they also cushion the bones from, from grinding on bone. You know that over time you've heard of slip discs or what happens is if I just, I'm gonna draw a couple of vertebrae in side view here, like a couple of thoracic or lumbar vertebrae and the, the fibrocartilage is in blue. There's an intervertebral disc you know that, you know, I know most of you know this, sometimes those discs over time they get compressed and they start to bulge outward like this. In all of us actually over time they get compressed just due to gravity and old age. But that can cause this disc to impinge upon a nerve and cause a lot of pain. So surgeons like to go in there <clears throat> and sort of just shave off that excess portion, which I didn't mean to shave off my vertebrae. I meant to shave off those bulging portions of the disc. <clears throat> Locations, we did that. Functions, we did that. Let's go on to the last type of cartilage, which is elastic cartilage. And you bet you can guess why it gets its name. It has elastic fibers in it. <clears throat> 
that have the protein elastin. Uh, this one looks a little different. It still has big lacunae or cavities where those cells live, and they tend to be really large in elastic cartilage. The fibers are not big sort of coiled collagen fibers like in fiber cartilage. They're thin stringy fibers and they're kind of haphazardly arranged. They kind of look like spider webs between these. It looks something like this. These cavities are well defined. There's a living cell in each one of them. That's what elastic cartilage looks like. A, a word of warning, a word of caution. It's easy to mix up elastic connective tissue with elastic cartilage. They're two separate things. Obviously this one is a true cartilage. Locations, classic locations would be the outer ear. What you and I call the ear is really just the outer structure of the ear mechanism. Uh, it's full of elastic cartilage, which, which gives it structure, but it also gives it the ability to recoil. If you fold your ear forward and let go, it snaps back into position. And also the epiglottis. Those are two classic examples of elastic cartilage locations. The epiglottis, I know you've heard of it, and if you're not sure what it is, it's a flap of elastic cartilage that covers the trachea so that when we swallow food, that flap closes. It's a, it's a reflex response from the brainstem. As soon as we start to swallow anything, that epiglottis flap closes over our trachea so that nothing goes down our our windpipe, our, our air passageway. You know that that's not 100% effective, but it's, it's pretty good. Um, function, I'm just gonna write structure and recoil. Recoil is, the, uh, is sort of the big one because it's full of these elastic fibers. All right, we're done with cartilage. Let's just do two types of bone tissue. So just to bring you back to the beginning, now we've done CT proper bone. We've only got two tissues to do in bone and two in fluid, and then we're done with connective tissues. So I think I'm gonna call the new board for bone. In general, just to give you some general characteristics, you know where bone is located all over the body attached to skeletal muscles. Um, in general, bone gives a structural and protection. I'll list some of the other functions in a minute. But osteoblasts would secrete bone matrix. They're immature bone cells that secrete that bone matrix. Osteocytes, would be mature bone cells that just maintain the matrix. They're no longer actively secreting. <clears throat> so let's just say something about that matrix. It contains, we'll talk way more about this when we do the skeletal system. It contains, some, some books say calcium salts, others say calcium and phosphate. And I'll write calcium salts and phosphate, it's a storage place for phosphorus. <clears throat> and it also contains a lot of thick collagen fibers. There's another type of bone cell, I'm not even gonna write it down because I'm not gonna test you on this on this quiz, but there, there are other types of bone cells but besides these two. Let's just start on quiz, lecture quiz two, that you know what these two are and what they do. So immature bone cell and mature bone cell and the immature form is what secretes that non-living matrix. <clears throat> There's two types of bone tissue. Compact bone, which is that hard calcified material that you and I think of when we hear the word bone. And it's found, so I'm just gonna write hard, dense. Location would be specifically 
I find most of it in the shaft of long bones. And covering surfaces of ends and flat bones. I'll be specific after I write this. I'll draw you a picture. So really quickly, if I draw just like a generic humerus here. The compact, the, here's, here's the humerus is filled with these little tiny bone needles. All long bones look like this, by the way. The ends have these little needles or spicules in them. That's going to be the second type of bone tissue. And in the spaces between these little bone spicules is what we call bone marrow. It's not, it's not empty in here. There's this jelly-like stuff called bone marrow. And then compact bone makes up the hard surface here around the end of the long bone as well as the majority of the shaft of these bones. There is a cavity in the middle. That's what I'm drawing. But all of this is compact bone here. <clears throat> the second type of bone tissue is called spongy bone. And that's the, this, these tiny bone spicules or needles. They're called trabeculi. So those little tiny bone needles or spicules have a name. That's supposed to be an E. Get my eraser, there we go. Those trabeculi are the little needles. And in spongy bone, we find specifically in the ends of long bones and the center of flat bones. And spongy bone is made up of tiny little trabeculi with red marrow in the spaces. Red marrow is that jelly-like um, stuff, material, where stem cells, blood stem cells occur. So this spongy bone is the site of blood cell synthesis. All of our red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets come from this red marrow found in spongy bone. When you study in AMP2, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit more when we study the skeletal system, but when you study blood as a whole unit in AMP2, that's when I mostly talk about bone marrow and the functions of it and the stem cells. All right, we finished up bone. Let's go on to our final and last. So we've done proper cartilage bone. Let's do fluid. <clears throat> fluid connective tissues are basically blood, two types, and lymph. Blood, you know where that's found. It's in the cardiovascular system. Blood is a connective tissue. So here's how there are living cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets found suspended in a fluid medium. They're not dissolved in there. They're just suspended in that fluid medium, and it's the plasma is the matrix. Fluid and so where are the fibers in that matrix? Well, it's kind of a secret They're They're dissolved in the plasma and Normally those fibers Stay in a dissolved state. They only come out of solution when we start to bleed and So the process of hemostasis of blood clotting is an enzymatic process and it ends with those fibers coming out of solution to block the loss of blood to block the wound <clears throat> so I'm just going to write this. We've got red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Those, that's the living component 
plasma would be the non-living matrix. Lymph, this is just lymph fluid that we find in the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is basically just a bunch of vessels, um, not unlike blood vessels. And lymph fluid, to, to give you context, if you didn't know this, really comes from the blood. So in 30 seconds, I'll describe to you how lymph is formed. Our blood travels throughout the body, and when it gets to the capillary level of the circulation system, the vascular system, stuff gets pushed out of the blood vessels. Stuff meaning fluid, as well as what's dissolved in it. So usually the living cells are too large in size to get pushed out, and that's a good thing, to get pushed out of those vessels. But the fluid and things dissolved in the fluid, like oxygen, CO2, hormones, nutrients, waste products, that does get pushed out at the capillary level. Most of that gets reclaimed, most of that fluid gets reclaimed right away. Some of it does not. A few liters of fluid per day end up in getting collected by lymph capillaries or lymph vessels. So really this fluid is just, it, it comes from the blood and the whole travel path of lymph fluid is out from our extremities, far away from the heart, and it ends up, its destination is to get dumped back into the cardiovascular system, just superior to the heart. So this is just, lymph is just fluid that was derived from blood plasma, and it's making its way back into the, the cardiovascular system. Along the way, along its travels, it flows through lymph nodes, <clears throat> which are basically immune filters that kill foreign invaders that, that are found in that fluid. Okay, so we've done all the fluids. Before I cut this off, I'm gonna mention, I don't even know if I wrote this today, so I need to go back to my first diagram. I think I just started with connective tissue, I did. Just to remind you really quickly, the major tissues, four major tissues in the human body are epithelial, connective tissue, muscular, and nervous. So I'm gonna say just a few things, quick things about these two. We study these in great detail later in the semester. So muscular tissue, there's three types in the human body. I'm gonna list those and just say a few words about them. This is all in your textbook. There's skeletal muscle, that is found attached to our bones. That's what you and I think of when we hear the word muscle, quite frankly. It's the stuff attached to our bones. That's its location, some characteristics of skeletal muscle. It's voluntary, that means we have conscious control over the contractions of this muscle. The cells are striated when we look at them under a microscope. That just means they have stripes on them. The cells are also multinucleate. They have more than one nucleus. I'll explain how that occurs when we study the muscular system. And finally, the major functions of skeletal muscle are movement. When they contract, it, it produces movement. Also, they produce heat, keep the body warm, and they store glycogen, which is that stored form of glucose. Second type of muscular tissue is smooth muscle. That gets its name because it does not have striations. It looks smooth. So not striated. It's also involuntary. Cells have one nucleus. And the locations, we find this smooth muscle in vessel walls and lining organ walls. I'm just gonna put lining organs. So we don't have conscious control over the contractions. It just happens on its own without our really even consciously thinking about it. And third, 
is cardiac muscle. Found only in the heart, no other place. Cardiac muscle looks like skeletal muscle. It's striated. It looks a lot more like skeletal muscle than smooth muscle, but it's involuntary. We don't have conscious control over the contractions. <clears throat> Cardiac muscle, as far as the, nu the number of nuclei per cell, is somewhere between numbers one and two. It can have one to two nuclei per cell, but it's not nearly as multinucleate as skeletal muscle. And it's, it has these special connections. The, the muscle cells are typically long and cylindrical. And the cardiac muscle has these special connections longitudinally from cell to cell that other muscle cells don't have like this. Another group of cells might be coming this way. And there's another connection here. What those, those connections are called inter, I'll put it in black since I drew them in black. They're called intercalated discs. Those are connection points from cell to cell. They're typically longitudinal connections. What that does is it provides for electrical coupling or transmission from cell to cell so that the cells all contract like a, like a symphony all at once or almost all at once. We don't want all of the heart cells, the cardiac muscle cells, to be contracting at different times. That doesn't produce a very effective pump. So these intercalated discs provide for a syncytium, a synchronization of that contraction. Okay, let's go on to nervous tissue. Not gonna say a lot about this. There's, it's found in the brain, spinal cord, and peripheral nerves. That's its location. Um, there are basically two categories or two types of cells. And the first one are called neurons. Those are the money cells. Those are the ones that initiate and propagate electrical impulses. These cells are, just to give you a few characteristics, <clears throat> are amitotic. That means no cellular division. And what that means is once these cells are destroyed or injured they typically <clears throat> uh, don't they don't revive themselves nor do we make new ones you've probably heard you might have heard the, the expression that once you lose brain cells they're gone for good and that's pretty pretty much true um, and for so the next characteristic is good they have long lifespans because they have to last our our entire life they also have a very high metabolic rate. All right, let's leave it at that. They tend to look like this. You're not gonna to have to identify anything on this extra test. They tend to have these long branches coming out off of the cell body. There's the cell body with the nucleus and these little processes they're called or branches have specific names and functions which we'll talk about when we study the nervous system. The second class of cells, and there's a whole bunch of them. There's like six of specific ones. They're called neuroglia. These are just support cells. They do not conduct electrical impulses. I'll talk about those when we study the nervous system. Okay. Um, I'm gonna just verbally, I have, uh, I have my textbook in front of me. We've gotten through most of the chapter now. I'm just gonna, verbally talk about different types of membranes that your, your book mentions. Um, they, they talk about three types of membranes, cutaneous membranes, mucous membranes, and serous membranes. Cutaneous membrane, when you see that expression, that's your skin. That's your outer covering, the epidermis, that's largely made up of keratinized 
squamous, um, stratified squamous epithelial cells with super tight junctions. And it tends to be uh, very dry relative to the other membrane. So the cutaneous membrane just thinks skin, stratified squamous epithelium, tight cellular junctions, and it's keratinized. That means it, and I'll talk about that next week when we, when we specifically talk about the integumentary system. The second type of membrane in your book are mucous membranes. So I'm going to write this cutaneous. This is a whole new topic. I'll just write these words down. Cutaneous membranes. And the second one I'll go in order are mucous, M-U-C-O-U-S, mucous membranes. Mucous membranes are found uh, at boundaries to the external environment other than the cutaneous membrane. So for example, the entrances and exits to the body and the linings of those systems. So we have mucous membranes um, all the way down our GI tract. Uh, that provides a protective barrier because the cells are closely knit together as well as secretion of mucus-based products. So mucous membranes line our GI tract, they line our respiratory system, they line our urinary system, uh, reproductive tracts. And finally, uh, the serous membranes. I, I think I mentioned this way back in chapter one or two, but serous membranes are double-walled fluid secreting membranes. And in particular, they're found around the heart so these are examples, the pericardium, the pleura, around the lungs. So the pericardium's around the heart, pleura around the lungs, and the peritoneum around our abdominal organs. Serous means it's fluid secreting. And the, between these two membranes, fluid is secreted in this space and the two layers of membranes are visceral and parietal. Visceral being the, the layer that's closest to the organ itself, parietal being the outside layer that's closer to the cavity. The reason that this fluid is secreted is almost always to reduce friction for moving parts. The heart beats multiple times a day, the lungs move in and out multiple times every minute, and our abdominal organs also there's a lot of movement mostly through digestion finally last topic i promise believe me i'm tired too um, i'm going to briefly talk about tissue repair i wanted to try to highlight or touch on every topic that your that your book addresses with tissue repair there's basically uh, i think what your book describes is two ways or methods of tissue repair the first one is regeneration the second one is fibrosis when you see the word regeneration that just means replacing the same tissue with the tissue that was injured so i'm just going to put replace with like or same sorry same tissue <clears throat> During regeneration, that the it's a it's a full replacement. Fibrosis is a process of replacing the original tissue with fibrous tissue, what you and I call scar tissue. It's not necessarily the same tissue that was damaged. Now most, the very, very minor superficial damage to um, our tissues can undergo full regeneration. But by and large, any significant injury, it's a combination of these two types of, of tissue repair. We get some original tissue regeneration and some scar tissue forming, some fibrosis. And how much of each happens depends on a lot of things. It depends on the tissue that was originally damaged, the severity of the injury, the location, the age of the individual. Uh, young people tend to heal and regenerate a lot more easily than elderly people uh, for several aging reasons. So I'm just gonna list the steps to repair. 
the process of tissue repair. And those would be first, and what happens first is inflammation. So we get damage and the first response is inflammation. So the damage causes release of chemicals from the injured tissue. Sometimes it's called tissue factor. Um, macrophages and mast cells engulf that area and release those histamines, uh, uh, particularly mast cells, causing more inflammation. <clears throat> that causes capillaries in the area, blood vessels, to dilate. Um, that brings in nutrition, more macrophages, <clears throat> and blood clotting then eventually occurs, hemostasis. The second process that begins is what your book calls organization. During organization, we get <clears throat> sort of the beginning, the first stages of true tissue repair. A blood clot that was formed in stage one from hemostasis is replaced <clears throat> by granular tissue. I'm gonna write that out. We've all seen granular tissue, you probably didn't know its name. That's that really light pink tissue that's, that first starts to form during repair. It's very soft and delicate. Um, during organization, we also develop typically a new blood supply, so new capillaries form, bringing more blood and nutrition to that area for repair. Largely, also what can influence repair is the nutrition of the individual. Vitamin C in particular plays an important role in tissue damage repair. <clears throat> so we get fibroblasts, now secreting new fibers and tissue growth factor is a chemical that is oftentimes secreted by fibroblasts <clears throat> and we also now we get new collagen protein and fibers being formed in the repair process during organization. And third is the process of regeneration and fibrosis, replacing old tissue with new original tissue or and or, it's usually a combination, some sort of fibrous tissue or scar tissue. <clears throat> so the, what happens is the regeneration process um, causes the blood clots and some granular tissue to be pushed off in the form of like a scab, for example. <clears throat> and regenerated epithelium almost always has a little bit of fibrosis in it, scar tissue. Rarely is it 100% regeneration. Internally, though, regeneration, I think, is, is a little bit more common. So it, in simple infections, for example, a regeneration is quite common, but severe damage, I need to go to a new whiteboard here, so let me, I used up my 10 boards, so I have to pull up a whole new set. <clears throat> this is it, guys, last thing I'm writing, I promise. Tissue regeneration capabilities. We're just going to classify tissues based on their capability. Uh, specific tissues, now you know what they are in the human body, whether or not they are highly regenerative, moderately generative, so on and so forth. Highly regenerative tissues in the human body would include things like epithelial tissue, Osseous tissue or bone is very regenerative. Uh, areolar, that loose connective tissue. <clears throat> Blood is, very, is highly regenerative. Oftentimes, the highly regenerative tissues, not always, but oftentimes they have stem cells associated with them, as in this and this particularly, but also uh, dense irregular is highly regenerative. 
now I'm just going to write moderate. Different textbooks use different classifications. I think I'm using the language that Marie and Hohn use. This would be things like um, smooth muscle. Uh, dense, regular, those tendons and ligaments are fairly regenerative when they get damaged. <clears throat> now, the next group of tissues have some minimal regenerative capabilities, but we call them weakly regenerative, and that would be skeletal muscle. So the muscles attached to our bones have weak regenerative capabilities. They're not super regenerative. Cartilage, technically, I would say, lies somewhere between moderate and weak. Um, but cartilage tends to not regenerate very well. And finally, none. I'm listing cardiac muscle because your book does. And, and when I ask you on the quiz about cardiac muscle, I want you to remember that it has no regenerative capabilities. FYI, I don't like to contradict the textbook because I think it confuses students, but there is brand new research out that suggests some cardiac muscle cells may be able to regenerate based on specific circumstances, but it's complicated. So let's just classify that as none. Uh, and finally, central nervous system, brain and spinal cord. Once that gets damaged, it's not coming back. Peripheral nerves uh, have some regeneration capabilities, but the brain and spinal cord, practically zero. Okay, I'm gonna cut my recording.